When we're speaking, how can we talk so that we project God's love to the world? That's what we'll talk about today. Words which do not give the light of Christ increase the darkness. Mother Teresa. Today we're going to talk about the book, Don't Drop the Mic, The Power of Your Words Can Change the World by T.D. Jakes. He said that he didn't intend to write a book like this. I don't know what book he was planning on writing, but the inspiration just kept coming to him about trying to teach people how to communicate, how to have a powerful voice in almost every situation. And somehow he realized through the pandemic that everyone was at home, but all we had was each other's voices, whether we were on Zoom meetings, whether we were talking to each other on the phone or leaving messages for each other, the power of our voices became even more important while we were separated. And so he realized how powerful speech is. Starts off by giving a quote from Epictetus, and I love those types of quotes if you know anything about me. But the quote is, first learn the meaning of what you say and then speak. And he talks about Dr. King and how Dr. King was controversial. People were talking about violence and violence towards each other. Boy, doesn't that sound like our world today? It's all about punching the person next to us, shutting up the person saying the thing. And now Dr. King was talking about no violence, about peace, about love, and not about hate. And that, unfortunately, at that time was countercultural. And he said he had one big lesson from all of this. Quote, a man with a microphone could change the world. Isn't that stunning? And so he wanted to help us find ways that we can share our own message more powerfully, better, so we can grab people with whatever it is we're trying to say. He says that all these great speeches in the world are amazing, helped our understanding, changed opinions, brought emotions. And he says, quote, History would be vandalized if we lost the great speeches and the founding documents. Words are important and powerful. And so he says that right now, because we can talk across the entire world. And if you look at this podcast, I have listeners from 15 different nations. My other podcast, which has been around three times as long, goes out to 68 nations. Who am I? Jill from the North Woods. Our voices reach the entire corners of the earth. It's stunning to see how many places that we can talk to, have communications with, get to meet people from all through the power of the internet. And he said that because we have that power, don't think of it as just audio. Don't think of it as just our voice, but it is all sorts of different parts of communication. This is where he talks a little bit about video too. Because some of it has to do with the pause. You know, how you use your voice is important. But then when it comes to video, he says that our smile, the way we look, gives messages too. This is where I fail a little bit. I know that I don't like to be on Zoom meetings in camera as often. I feel like I don't listen very well. I feel like I'm always shifting around in my seat more and I'm more self-conscious. But he's right, because so much of communication is the face, the smile, the eyes. We lose a lot if we're not on video. And so that's important, too. Our body language tells people all sorts of things about it. And so because now technology has increased how many people we talk to, how many people we could potentially talk to, it's a whole new world. And so he says in order for us to have good communication, we're going to have to learn how to translate the technology, transcend the technology with our words and our expression so that we can reach people even better. And he says that the important part is that people understand what you're saying. If we get confused about the words, he says, why email doesn't work so well. You write someone an email and there's so much room for misunderstanding because maybe we said a sentence that made it sound like we were angry and we weren't. Communication, when we're doing it verbally and doing it with the camera, can be so more understood, so much depth, because understanding is the whole point. 
if we don't help the other person understand us, it's lost. And what message we're trying to share is gone in that entire piece. And even the emotion, he says, that the emotions we're trying to teach people, that's important too. And he says that we're going to have cultural context. We're going to have slang. We're going to have all sorts of things. But in the end, we have to communicate our message in that emotion. And even talks about colloquial phrases. You know, we have those all the time. I come from the North Woods and we say things all the time with phrases. And he gives one saying, quote, something in the milk ain't clean. He chuckles at those, but those phrases make things seem fresh. It conveys a message that the mere words don't express because we understand what a phrase is. So learning this communication will help us in every way. And of course, all sorts of things affect our communication. Where we come from, I'm from the North Woods. I can talk like Fargo if I want to. And, and we have the ways that we talk, our tone, our senses of humor, our jokes, what we like to talk about, and even the phrases that we use it has a lot to do with where we grew up, what kind of community we grew up in, and what kind of phrases we have. I hear myself talk all the time in words that my grandmother used, or I hear myself talk all the time from the place I'm from, which is the North Woods. And my communication style is very folksy, up North woodsy talk. You know, that's just who I am and where I belong. And so we want to present our phrases, express our views of who we are, but also in a way that people can understand us. He says it's important that we speak from the soul, which means we're going to dig down deep and try to express our emotion and what we're going to talk about. We don't want to just put out a point, dot, 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 bullet points of information. He says that even if we follow all the rules of communication and grammar and all the things we're supposed to do, it sometimes can fall flat. And he says that sometimes you just have to break every rule you have and be yourself. And even if it doesn't follow that rule, if you can convey that emotion, it will mean so much more. And that emotion you have can help people who are feeling hurt or afraid or all the things that you're trying to convey. I remember my friend when she first started doing public speaking, she really hates it. She just dislikes it from every way you can. And she got up with a very carefully prepared speech and presentation. And what happened? She talked about these valuables that this woman had that came from, I believe, her mother's experience in a concentration camp, and they were valuable to her. And when her house was broken into and those things were stolen, it was devastating. And my friend started to choke up. And it's not the thing you want to do when you're public speaking. You want to keep a presence. You want to go through your plan. You have this all diagrammed of how you're going to speak. But that emotion of what it meant to have these special items stolen by someone who's probably just going to trash them, throw them out, sell them, conveyed everything in that presentation and made it real. And so that's where breaking all the rules can make your presentation, your speech, your communications, even if it isn't textbook, mean everything to the people you're talking to. He says that you shouldn't get afraid you know, you think about all the things that will block your ability to communicate. You're scared that it's not going to work out, that you're going to make a fool of yourself. I remember talking to people at my conferences at work. I'm afraid to go up there and say my speech. And I'd be like, everybody here is on your side. You have valuable information they want to hear. Your only job is to help them hear it. And I think, at least I hope, it helped them. But people are really afraid of public speaking. He says and mentions this, that people are more afraid of public speaking than death, cancer, unemployment, spiders, and snakes. It just is the thing that scares everyone. But he says that you should go for it. He said that the old phrase is nothing ventured, nothing gained. But he says it should be nothing ventured, something is lost. Your voice is gone. If you don't speak, and you don't tell your story, or my friend doesn't tell the story of how hurtful this theft was of her home, no one is going to, and no one's going to hear that message. 
people will lose something in this world because you're not willing to speak. It's important to keep whatever you're going to say real, fitting you. He gives the story of David and Goliath and how Saul gave him his armor. But eventually, when David gets on the battlefield, he takes off the armor because it just didn't fit him. It wasn't his fighting style. It wasn't the way he did things. And he was mocked for it and everything like that. But it worked for him. He became himself in that moment. And that's what the author is telling us to do. Become ourselves. Take off the armor that's not fitting for us and be the people we were meant to be. He says, quote, and let your words land where they land. It's a powerful message. But he says, you know what? There's big giants out there today, just like David and Goliath. And you will be able to use your voice to fight against these giants, whether it's injustice or people who haven't heard the word of God. You'll be able to fight your own giants with your own sling, which is going to be your voice. It's important, he says, to have conviction because it's the people who have conviction that will make the whole world change. And if we silence ourselves, if we go hide in the cave, if we become so uncomfortable, we're not willing to speak, the world is at a loss for the things that you are going to say and you never did say. He says, quote, when you know you're doing what God compels you to do, when you know the truth of what motivates you, then you will not be deterred by your detractors. God is on your side. He had the back of David. He had the back of Samuel. And he says that we have to face our fears, whatever makes us scared, whatever turns us off about communicating with other people in public, because that is where we're going to tell the story from our own heart. I think in the end, that's why AI is not going to work, because it's not telling a person's story. It's not telling anything from your gut. It's not telling anything that you know from your experiences. And that's what's important for you to say what matters. I know that I've seen people who would want to just have ChatGPT write a speech for them. And you know what? It's never going to work because it's not what matters. It's not saying the thing that you as an individual could say if you would just let your own heart speak. And you know, the honest truth is I've, I've spoke a million times and what you're afraid of, I've been afraid of, and your fears. And if you are afraid of those things, What you're imagining in your head is going to happen is not going to happen. You will be able to speak and you'll be able to have a good path if you can fight off all those physiological fears, the mental fears, if you can beat them back and learn how to work while those are happening and overcome them, and you'll be able to say the things you need to say. You'll find methods, he says, of relaxing and he's suggest even like if you sip some water, you can feel it going down your throat and use it as a visualization of your mind and body calming down, thinking of it as a lake or someplace serene and that peace just going through your body as you drink this water. There's ways that you'll be able to find in order to get over your fear of speaking in front of other people. It says too that, of course, speaking the Bible saying God's truth will have a spiritual impact in there. There's a lot of forces out there in the world that don't want your message of God and God's love to be out there. And so you have to realize that you're fighting your own adversary in doing this speech. And when you overcome the fear, you're overcoming those bad things out there that are trying to stop your voice from being heard. He says, quote, Your time has come, so speak up. And the chapter three was preach, but don't preach, which means that you don't want to preach at people. It has this negative connotation that you're barking orders at people or you're condemning them, making them feel little. You're going to want to translate what you're trying to say in a way that the people listening to you will have the maximum benefit impact. You know, you always see those TV shows from ages ago with pastors who are screaming fire and brimstone at people. And you have to wonder, I guess they were trying to scare people into doing the right thing. But is that sharing God's love? 
is that having the maximum impact that pastor could have? And it's not necessarily an old versus new thing because we have heard and know of many pastors who could inspire people throughout all the ages, including the apostles and other people. So we know it's not just a new thing to speak kindly, to have an impact with people. It is a thing for the ages. This was an interesting part of his book. It was called Excavation Before Exclamation. And I think what he means is that we're going to dig and find the right material for our speech. We're going to do research. We're going to put together everything. So he believes in taking out and digging out what he calls all the bones. You're going to craft your speech. So you're going to pull out all the elements, all the things that you're hoping to say, all the ideas that you have for getting it. And you're going to write them down, create an outline for the things you want to say, and then getting them into a logical order so they fit together. We want them not to just to fit together in a logical sense, but in a way that the heart speaks to as well. A lot of times I try to write these podcasts in a way that makes sense to someone who's trying to change their life. If I was probably writing a research paper, I probably would organize it a little bit different. He says he calls this process digging for bones, where you're looking for the essence of what it is you're trying to say, and then you're going to put life into it. You're going to breathe life into your speech. You're going to find how to take these topics, these ideas, collect them, and turn them into something that will be memorable for people. And you're going to be the detective or he says the archaeologist, who's going to find those things. You're going to find illustrations, quotes, how people did this in the past, and you're going to put life into your examples or your outline. That's the part where you come in. Of course, AI could write our outline for us, but the idea is you're going to breathe life into things, and that is something that AI will never replace. He says that you finally get your message together He says, first of all, you may be surprised to find that you have enough information for more than one presentation. I mean, look at this podcast. I will have this idea. I'm going to talk about a specific book. And whoops, all of a sudden, we're at 20 minutes and 10 seconds. Time for me to wrap up. I haven't gotten halfway through my page. That means that it's time to end this podcast and start thinking about doing a second podcast. I've had so much material that I'm not going to be able to cover it in one episode. That's how this happens, by the way. But even when I'm doing presentations or public speaking, sometimes I realize, ooh, not only do I have enough material for two presentations, but you know what? The topics are diverting into two separate streams. This is one point and this is another point. And mixing them together hasn't been that great. Me separating them into two different presentations, I'll do the next one at the next conference, makes a clearer message, makes for a more grabbing presentation, and it also gives me fodder for the next presentation so I don't have to write it from scratch. But we will see a few things about it when we get done, is we'll see what is not similar to the rest of the topic, we'll see what doesn't support our main ideas or distracts from our main ideas. And that's what we'll know where maybe we have two speeches or maybe something should just get cut out and used for something else some other day. Maybe it's not a complete presentation. I've done that too, where I've presented a book to you, talked about something. Wow, this is a really interesting topic and thought it distracts from the main point of the book that I'm trying to talk about. And so I will come up with another book that just talks about that point a little bit later. So we have to pare things down. We have to be able to cut things that matter. He said that he has something that he wrote that was amazing and he had to cut it out because it just didn't fit with the rest of the piece. Even though he had done research on it, he thought it was masterful, emotional. It was all the things he wanted to do. And he said that A lot of authors call this kill your little darlings, which even if means if you love something that you've written, maybe it has to go and maybe it just doesn't fit. And so he says that in the end, when we decide what gets in or out of our presentation, we have to ask two questions. Who cares? And so what? Which means, does this even matter 
to the people who I'm speaking to? Or does it matter to the presentation I'm getting? Who cares? And so what? And with those two questions, we'll be able to fulfill the purpose of our speech. I notice uh, he talks a little bit about pastors who will give historical context and documentation and maps. And you know what? I'll eat that up all day. When I see a pastor haul out a map, I'm never more happy at any point because I love that kind of context. But I know a lot of people don't enjoy that. I would sit there and listen to a pastor talk for three hours with maps and diagrams and charts and linguistics, and the rest of my friends would punch me for ever suggesting it. They want the music. They want the other parts of the service. And so again, you're going to have to hone your message so that we can answer who cares and so what. So my challenge to you is come up with an outline for something that you would love to tell other people, maybe about your faith, maybe about your story, and see if you can't come up with a five-minute elevator speech that fulfills some of these things and helps you get off the ground in talking to people about your story. Can you make it compelling? Can you make it have one message? And can it reach out to people? And you can ask the question, who cares and so what? And come up with great answers. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that I have the other podcast, which is Start With Small Steps, talks more about productivity tips. But you can always email me if you have a prayer request, if you have any questions at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. And remember, the road of powerful communication starts with small steps so we can slay our giant Goliaths.